Good morning, students. Uh, please turn with me to Psalm 84. <clears throat> Today's message comes from Psalm 84. Um, but before we begin, as you are turning there in your Bibles, uh, let me remind you of our uh, summer online uh, book reading. Uh, here's the book. Uh, I showed you guys this last week. It's called This Changes Everything, How the Gospel Transforms the Teen Years. It was written by a teenager, two teenagers, uh, about the impact of the gospel on teenage lives. Um, here's what I want you to do. As I, as I said uh, last week, hopefully by now you have bought the book or are in process of buying the book. I sent the Amazon link to your parents. The link is also in the comments section of this video. I don't care if you get it from Amazon. I don't care where you get it from. Just buy it and, and read a chapter. There are eight chapters in the book. Read one chapter and then watch the video. I have recorded and uploaded eight discussions, eight videos that I've had with one of our youth students. Um, there are eight videos, as I said, because there are eight chapters in the book. Each recording is about uh, 15 minutes long. It is there to augment your uh, learning um, and your time in the chapter. And then, of course, just repeat. Uh, repeat this uh, eight times. And then as you continue on and read the book, all eight videos uh, are or should be available on our church's YouTube page, the same YouTube page that you are finding my recorded sermons, this one right now. I've uploaded all of them so that you can read at your own pace. You can finish the book in a week. You can read a chapter a week. It doesn't matter. Uh, the point is to read it and to learn from the book, learn about yourself, learn about God, and try to apply it to your lives. I hope um, these directions are clear. And of course, uh, uh, if you have any questions, you can always email me or text me or, or whatever, all right? Um, let's get to uh, the topic at hand for today. As I said, today's passage is Psalm 84. And so if you have your Bibles open, uh, please look on with me as I read Psalm 84. To the choir master, according to the Giddith, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise, Selah. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob, Selah. Behold our shield, O God, look on the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly, O Lord of hosts. Blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we give you uh, this time, uh, this text. Will you enliven it for us, not only in our minds, not only in our ears today, but also in our hearts, Lord Father. May we see more of you in it. May we learn more of ourselves and give us the courage and the boldness and the fortitude to implement it into our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, students, Psalm 84 is online. Uh, most of the Psalms that we studied during this quarantine period, uh, most of the Psalms that we've looked at thus far, I think generally are singular in thematic structure. 
Uh, most of them can be neatly categorized into one particular genre or another. Well, Psalm 84 isn't like that. It almost reads like a stream of consciousness, right? Like, like unedited prose flowing in and out uh, of genres like lament and praise, switching between forms like a hymn or a prayer. There is no dominant theme here, but there is one appropriate and applicable lesson for us. And it is related, and is related to the title uh, of my message. So uh, here's what I mean. Let me, let me unpack what I'm trying to say. Uh, the opening section of Psalm 84 contains the language of love poetry. Look at it. Look at the first two verses. The phrase, how lovely is an exclamation of amazed glorification. If you're writing this in modern English, if you were texting this, you could probably write it with a couple of exclamation points behind it. Uh, but the author's effusive praise doesn't stop there. He states that he longs, meaning yearns, and faints, meaning he becomes exhausted for the courts, for the presence uh, of God, so much so that he even sings for joy. Um, some commentators note that this is not an accurate, that singing for joy is not an accurate translation. It is not that the author was so overwhelmed with joy that he sings, uh, or rather, he is lovesick. And so they note that he's not singing for joy. Um, instead, he is, he is crying out. Uh, in longing. Uh, regardless, uh, you know, I noticed something interesting about these two verses uh, when we apply it to our modern lives. Isn't this the same emotions and reactions we have towards food? Uh, I mean, think about a feast, right? An amazing spread of food for a birthday party, a wedding, a Super Bowl party, Thanksgiving, New Year's, or whatever, a grand buffet even. Um, when we see the food, uh, don't we exclaim how lovely, how amazing. And when we go without food uh, for a period of time, we long for it, right? We even faint for it. And when we go without food for a longer period of time, we can get angry or hangry and we cry out for it. Um, C.S. Lewis uh, made a similar connection. He summarized the attitude of the writer here in, verse, uh, in the first two verses as having an appetite for God. Uh, hence the title of my message. And with that, um, that is the one appropriate application lesson uh, for our Bethel Youth Group context that we can pull out of this psalm. Students, I ask you, do you have an appetite for God? Developing an appetite for God and growing in our appetite for God, is, it's, it's not an option. It's not reserved for some and not for others. It's a natural course of every believer's life. Jaquel Crow, the author of the book that I'm asking you to buy and read, uh, she describes it like this. She states that a Christian, uh, being a Christian, means treasuring Christ, valuing him above all things. And valuing Christ also means, she says, devaluing everything else. That doesn't mean we hate the things of the world. That doesn't mean we despise the things of the world. That doesn't mean everything in the world becomes trash. Rather... It simply means that Jesus has top priority. We want Jesus more. And so if you're tracking with me, hopefully you're asking this question. How do, we, how do I grow in my appetite for Christ? How do we want Jesus more uh, than everything else in this world? And so using this psalm, through Psalm 84, uh, I want to highlight three practical ways. Um, Three practical ways that we can grow in our desire, grow in our appetite for God. One, we grow in our appetite for God by spending time in His house. Uh, perhaps I, I should have explained this sooner, but we're going through a series uh, on the Psalms written by the sons of Korah. And the sons of Korah were from the tribe of Levi. The Levites 
uh, were particular were special because they were set apart by God for religious service. And thus, the sons of Korah, uh, along with the other Levites, uh, they served in the temple uh, in a variety of roles. During the 40 years that Israel wandered through the desert, the sons of Korah, along uh, with the other Levites, were, were responsible for uh, moving the tabernacle. Remember, in the 40 years of wandering, Israel was constantly on the move. That's why they lived in tents, uh, because tents were portable. And not only did they have to move their belongings, but they also had to move the tabernacle, the place where they worshipped God. And this responsibility of moving the tabernacle was given to the sons of Korah. They had to take everything in the tabernacle, move it to the new location, and set it back up just as it was before. Later in Israel's history, eventually this portable tabernacle, it became, uh, it was built into a permanent structure of the temple in Jerusalem. But even then, in the temple, in the permanent temple, the sons of Korah continue in their religious service, playing music, or, or leading choirs, or writing psalms, or even guarding the temple. You see, I think this is why the sons of Korah had such an appetite for God. This is why in verse 3, look at verse 3, the authors were envious of the birds who made their nest in the crevices of the walls of the temple. This is why, look in verse 4, the author writes, Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise. And this is why in verse 10, the author states, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere, because he and the other sons of Korah were constantly spending time with God, worshiping Him and serving Him in the temple in His house. Look at verse 4 more closely. The Hebrew word for dwell has a variety of connotations. It can mean to abide, meaning to remain with God, obedient to all his ways. It can also mean permanent residence, not like a visitor, uh, not like uh, 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 someone who lives at a place temporarily, but like a child, a son or daughter who lives and belongs in the house. Regardless, either way, to dwell conveys a sense of obedience and intimacy that only comes with time. Students cultivate your appetite for God by spending more time with Him. More specifically and more precisely to this passage, spend more time with God at church. Yeah, let's make it plain. Go to church or come to these events. I know COVID has shut down things right now, um, but think back uh, to when things were normal. How often did some of you come to church back then? Take your cue from the sons of Korah here. How can we expect to grow in our appetite for God and our desire for God if we don't any if we don't spend any time with Him? So as things slowly return to normal, as we eventually will return to church in the capacity that we once did, have the mentality to participate more in church events and physically come out to church. Sometimes just physically being there is half the battle. That's the first point. Grow in your appetite for God uh, by spending time in His house. Second point. Grow in your appetite for God by living with an eternal perspective. Uh, grow in your appetite for God by living with an eternal perspective. Uh, pastor and author Randy Alcorn, uh, this is what he wrote. Uh, I, think all, I think of our lives in terms of a dot and a line signifying two phases. Our present life on earth is the dot. It begins, it ends, it's brief. However, from the dot, a line extends that goes on forever. That line is eternity, which Christians will spend in heaven. Right now, we're living in the dot. But what are we living for? The short-sighted person lives for the dot. The person with perspective lives for the line. Some of you smart kids, um, understand exactly what Alcorn is saying. Uh, geometrically, technically, Alcorn is describing a ray, right? The concept of a ray perfectly illustrates this second point. We're growing our appetite for God by living for the line, not for the dot. Look at verse 5. 
the psalmist uh, writes, "Blessed are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart, uh, in whose heart are the highways to Zion." We talked about Zion before in the other psalms, the city of God. It can refer to the physical city of Jerusalem, or it can mean heaven, the new Jerusalem to come. Here in verse 5, I think it only refers to heaven because the text says within the believer's hearts are the highways or the pathways to Zion. In Hebrew, the highways here are not actual literal paved roads. No, it's literally written in Hebrew as pilgrim ways um, because the phrase highways to Zion is talking about the mindset of the believer. Students, Christians are strangers and pilgrims in this life. We studied that in high, uh, for the high school Bible study in First Peter. Earth is not our true home. Heaven is. And everything we do in this life is reflective of that. This is why the psalmist writes about the valley of Baca in verse 6. Scholars don't really know exactly where uh, this valley was. Regardless, the author uses the valley of Baca as a metaphor for the trials and hardships of life. This is why the psalmist in verse 7 states, They will go from strength to strength. Each one uh, appears before God in Zion. Because life is filled with uncertainty. And without Jesus, we live from uncertainty to uncertainty, from fear to fear, chaos to chaos. But by God's grace, by His blood, we live from one episode of dependence on God to another episode of dependence on God. From deliverance to deliverance, obedience to obedience. Until each one of us appears before God in Zion. Students that I bet I sound like a broken record by now, right? Uh, But please know that this is the message uh, of the Bible. And the Bible, it's repeating itself, not me. Please believe that this this is not the only life you'll live. That there is another life to come. There are greater things, eternal things to come. So develop your appetite for God by living with an eternal perspective. Do not live under the false, false notion that this, is, uh, this life is the only existence we have. Do not live in desperation, attempting to make so much of our earthly lives. And do not live without perspective. As I said, your total existence is a ray, not a dot. Live for the line. Not for the point. Lastly, we grow in an appetite for God by trusting in Him, by wholeheartedly trusting in Him. At the center of the psalm uh, is a prayer. The words reveal that there was a need. Look at verse nine. Behold our shield, O God. Look on our face. Look on the face of your anointed. The use of of words like shield and your anointed was in reference to the king of Israel. The king was a shield uh, and protection to his people. The king was the commander of its army, protecting the nation from invading powers. Also, Israel, or the, for, for Israel, the human king, like David, uh, was God's anointed. The king did not ascend to the throne by bloodline or hostile takeover. No, the king was appointed by God, sovereignly chosen by God, to reign in his place. Judging by the writer's prayer uh, here, something must have happened to the king. Perhaps he was sick and in need of healing, or perhaps the king was dead and there was a transition of power. Nevertheless, the author does not misunderstand the true source of his prosperity and security. Look at verse 11. Psalmist calls God the sun uh, because this was in reference to God being the ultimate source of light, joy, energy, and life. The psalmist also calls God a shield because God was the ultimate source of protection. Moreover, the psalmist writes, no good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly, because God is the one who blesses uh, the obedient. Students, this is a constant challenge for us, isn't it? The Bible teaches that God is the source of all good things. The world teaches the opposite. And, And the Bible teaches that living in obedience to God is the path to our best life. Do you 
Believe that. And if so, will you live like it? The author of Psalm forty-eight or Psalm 84 did. And thus he prayed to God during this time of unrest. And he declared, uh, look at the end of the, the psalm, blessed is the one who trusts in you. Students, how, how do we grow in our appetite for God? We must spend time with him, especially physically in his house. And we must live for him in the light of what Christ has accomplished for us on the cross and in light of the eternity to come. And we must trust in him. We must trust in him with all of our heart. And we must trust in him even over ourselves. Why? Because the psalm says he is the Lord of hosts. Look back over this psalm. The author addresses God with this moniker four times. But it's a strange title, isn't it? It doesn't make much sense to our modern ears. What does it mean, Lord of Hosts? Well, the Lord of Hosts is a military title. It means general or commander. And it is in reference to God as a commander of the angelic armies of heaven. But it speaks to God's power. It speaks to God's might speaks to his victory and glory. Students, this is the God whom the writer of Psalm 84 was talking about. This is the God whom the writer of Psalm 84 was praying to. And this is the God whom we worship every Sunday and every day today. Students, this is the God you need. This is the God you long for. We trust in that and believe in that. Spend time with him. Live for him. And wholeheartedly trust in him. Let's pray. Father, thank you uh, for Psalm 84. Thank you for your grace. That you remind us uh, of how to draw near to you. Thank you for your enduring patience. As we don't draw near to you. And yet your arms are always open wide. Uh, Lord of hosts, will you uh, show us who you are. Your almighty power. Your victory and might. In your amazing glory, help us to live for you. Help us to trust in you. Help us to spend time with you, Father. As things go back to normal, as we look forward to when things go back to normal, may we not go back, uh, but may we move forward in our faith, growing in you always. Thank you, Lord. I pray for my students. May they trust in you wholeheartedly. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.